everyone. I welcome you all to the online lecture series by CEC UGC. I am Nupur Chavla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. And today I am going to talk to you about uh, one of the very important essays in, uh, uh, in the feminist theory. And it's, uh, it is by uh, this woman called Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And the essay is titled Women and Economics. Now, this, of course, is uh, uh, you know a shortened version of or, or the shortened version of the title. Uh, we'll definitely talk about uh, the entire title in just a bit, but to very quickly first give you an idea that this essay is from the 19th century. It's written in 1898. So, uh, what we are then going to discuss today are the arguments of feminism. Uh, that were prevalent in the 19th century. So, as we all are aware that how feminism also, you know, kind of um, had different phases and each uh, uh, century, so to say, then, uh, you know, witnessed uh, some development in the stance of feminism as well, right? So, how the women's question uh, you know, kind of uh, underwent a change. There were new issues that were added. There was new approaches that were added. So all of that we witness um, as we read the texts by uh, various, uh, you know, uh, uh, women uh, 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 feminists, if you can call it that, or uh, all those women that were engaging with the um, issue, right? So uh, in uh, discussion today, then, uh, are these, uh, uh, you know, arguments in the 19th century that were put forth by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, right? And so now uh, if we look at the title, the, the complete title of the essay, it is Women and Economics, a study of the economic relation between men and women as a factor in social evolution. So you see the title itself is uh, quite long and uh, you know gives us a lot of insight into what possibly could be Gilman's uh, uh, you know contention over here right so we see that uh, so the first two terms are very important uh, women and economics so the foremost thing that we establish is that in the essay uh, you know Gilman is going to talk about the intersection of uh, the issue of gender and economics right so as we understand that uh, you know gender can be approached from various perspectives gender as a category has uh, you know kind of a different uh, dimensions to it it can be approached um, from the point of view of uh, society uh, which is the social dimension, it can be approached from the point of view of law, which is the legal dimension, it can be uh, also approached from the point of view of um, economics, right? So, um, in what, uh, from what lens or from what angle are we, uh, you know, kind of uh, examining the question of women or, or, or examining the question of um, gender then is uh, something that we need to be aware of whenever we uh, you know enter into such a theoretical discussion right so then gilman here we see is talking about the coming together of the uh, of the, of the women question uh, and economics right now the second part of the title says that it's a study of the economic relation between men and women as a factor in social evolution now again two phrases catch our attention here in the title in the in the second half of the title first is the economic relation between men and women right and the second phrase that catches our, our, our attention is social evolution okay so now you might wonder that what do we mean by the economic relation between men and women right so we do often talk about the uh, relation the interaction the terms of interaction between men and women but when she is talking about the economic relation what exactly is she trying to say that is something that's uh, going to be the crux of our discussion today right and then the second phrase that i've highlighted from the second part of the title is social evolution so you see uh, this also kind of gives us an idea uh, about what is the uh, driving force 
of Gilman's engagement with uh, this question of women and economics, right? The ultimate, um, uh, you know, parameter that's in her mind is social evolution, okay? So, uh, and you might wonder that what do we mean by social evolution, right? So, evolution, uh, if you look at the word, it means what? Uh, changing for the better, right? So, when she is talking about social evolution, she is trying to talk about how this uh, economic relation between men and women can be understood to further explain the idea of social evolution or how this interaction between men and women on economic grounds then becomes one of the features for us to think about uh, you know some kind of a social change right so that's uh, so to say uh, you know the complete title and we see that how just the title itself advances so many ideas okay now before i go on and uh, uh, you know kind of uh, discuss about the arguments which the um, uh, which the writer makes over here i wish to point out that in today's lecture we are going to talk about the first part of the essay all right uh, because it's a very long essay, it's about uh, close to 90 pages. So it's, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, to be able to do justice to it. So we're going to focus on one part and we're going to look at the arguments that she makes in the first part. Now, let us see what are the contentions uh, that Gilman makes. First, she looks at the, um, the prevalent notion during her times, that is the 19th century, the notion of economic progress, which was viewed always as masculine. Okay, so um, Gilman here engages with this idea of how, in her time, uh, you know, any idea of economic progress would automatically be um, uh, discussed in masculine terms, right? Which means what? That men would be the center of discussion, men would be at the center of any kind of a economic growth. So this is the first point that she seems to take up for discussion. The second contention that she uh, takes up in the essay, that is of uh, where she talks about the economic value of domestic industry. Now you might just wonder, what do we mean by domestic industry and what do we mean by economic value of domestic industry? So these are actually some words that you, you know, find uh, Gilman using in, um, in her essay. But that then forms a second important contention that she makes. So now what this exactly means, we're going to elaborate upon that in the course of the lecture. And the third thing and the third contention uh, that we're going to discuss today from the essay is where she talks about the claim of motherhood as a factor in economic exchange. Now, you might also, you know, be feeling a little startled because, you see, um, have we ever thought about motherhood in terms of economics? Maybe not. Maybe or maybe not, right? So, and particularly in terms of some kind of an exchange, right? So, now, these are some of the... Um, very interesting uh, ideas that Gilman puts forth um, in the essay and we're going to uh, take them up for discussion one by one. So beginning with the first one where she talks about economic progress as always considered to be as masculine. Okay. Now she actually over here mentions about a trend of her times, right, where uh, the the, uh, the prevalent or the major belief would be that man is at the center of any kind of a economic growth, right? So, uh, wherever there would be the context of handling elaborate machinery of trade, commerce, or even for that matter, the great engines of modern industry, all of these were kind of restricted to men, okay? So, there would be no mention but, uh, per se of women, um, when it comes to, uh, you know, the idea of machinery, the idea of trade, the idea of commerce, all these being significant, um, uh, you know, um, uh, contributors to uh, a society's growth in economic terms, right? So, how then men were uh, um, predominantly present 
in these uh, spheres while women were then conspicuous by their absence. Uh, now from here she goes on to say that this view or this prevalent view during the 19th century uh, of uh, the fact that our progress is masculine is not because of any disability of women, right? But it actually points towards the particular condition which forbids uh, the development of this degree of ability within women, right? So she very clearly states that it is not because women are, uh, you know, kind of that, that, that they fall short anywhere. Instead, the fact of the matter remains that the society itself forbids the development of any kind of a degree of ability, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, amongst women. And therefore, what happens that the matters of money, the matters of wealth, the matters of, uh, uh, for that matter, even big wealth remain restricted to men and let's not forget that this is the uh, um, this is the trend that she is talking about uh, which was prevalent in the 19th century at the time when she is writing this essay all right now further elaborating upon this uh, you know she gives the example of how women were further excluded from uh, from this idea of wealth and economics so it is not to say that women were not working right it is not to say that women were not contributing but the issue was that the fruits of their labor actually belonged to somebody uh, to uh, someone else right so now uh, she uh, she gives this example where she says that the, the, that the peasant women their labor is the property of another and i'm quoting this from the essay so she says that peasant women their labor is property of another what they receive is not dependent upon their labor but on the power and will of another they are economically dependent unquote so what do we see while on the one hand uh, it's the men who are considered to be as producers of wealth right on the other hand women in the 19th century were uh, primarily economically dependent and she gives a very um, you know a very sound logic to this that what does economic dependence mean uh, you know um, in the 19th century so she gives the example of the peasant women so she says that how the labor or the work which was done by women actually uh, uh, you know kind of uh, did not uh, get them the reward that was due to them okay and any reward that they would get if at all was uh, you know on the basis of the will of another individual right so which means what that women then were not like the, the 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 conditions were such that they were not able to generate money um, uh, you know on their own because their labor as she says was the property of another right so then they were always at the mercy of uh, another um, individual to uh, you know either recognize or not recognize the value of their labor so if that labor went unrecognized then of course uh, they would not be paid and that's how you know because their uh, b because their labor uh, was a property of another that is why she says that you know women were economically dependent in that sense and on the other hand, if we look at men, men were part of these, uh, you know, industries. Uh, they were they were part of trade and commerce, where their labor was not to that extent dependent upon, um, you know, uh, uh, upon the will or the power of another. And also, uh, 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 friends, let that that let's just keep in mind uh, that these are relative categories. Okay. So when we say that that uh, that that men's labor was not property of another, we are talking in relative terms as compared to women. So if women's labor was um, more, uh, uh, you know, kind of to a to a large extent, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, dependent upon uh, the power and will of another, when we talk about men 
uh, uh, in comparison, it was not the case. So that is why you know Gilman establishes that how compared to men, women were economically dependent in the 19th century, right? And again, it's not that they didn't have it in them to um, kind of prove themselves or to work, but instead it was just the matter of times, it was just the way society had been conditioned, okay? Now, another point that we need to keep in mind when we are discussing this first contention is that uh, Gilman, uh, you know, uh, mentions in her essay, and I will quote, she says that all social life is economically interdependent. Individual economic independence means individual pays for what he gets, works for what he gets, gives to the other an equivalent for what the other gives him, unquote. So now over here, she is further, you know, kind of seeing, uh, uh, explaining what do we mean by, uh, you know, or uh, she's, she's explaining the way, um, uh, you know, economic uh, 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 factors uh, operate, right? So economics uh, and, and how it operates in society. So she says that the foremost thing is that in a society, each one is economically interdependent, which means what? That individual, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, each individual is kind of, um, uh, you know, in a kind of an equation with another where one person, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, even uh, she says that whether it, uh, the, the individual economic independence in this kind of a framework would mean that the individual pays for what he gets, right? So, if you are getting some work done by someone, then you pay that person for the work that you are done. Uh, that you're getting done then she says that works for what uh, uh, for what she gets now, again it means what that whatever that you get you have to work for it so whatever if somebody is giving you right so like they say that that there's uh, that that nothing comes for free so whatever that you're getting from another person you are working for it okay so at one level you are paying an individual for what they do for you at another level, you get uh, something, uh, uh, you know, uh, by another individual uh, uh, only by means of working for them. And then it says that, uh, and then the third aspect is that uh, an individual gives to the other an equivalent for what the other gives him. Now, this is very, very important that an individual gives to another person the equivalent of what the other gives him means what that the kind of labor that one does should be justified in terms of the kind of payment that one gets for that labor so that uh, you know kind of uh, this uh, three level of economic interdependence uh, is what that she discusses right and now this needs to be put in context with just the preceding example that we had talked about that was of the peasant women where the labor of the peasant woman then doesn't belong to her. It is the property of another, which means what? That a lot of times, uh, you know, the pay that she would get for her labor would be completely dependent upon the whims and fancies of the person that she is working for. So there was no aspect of equivalence that Gilman has just now talked about, right? So, Hence, uh, you know, uh, further highlighting that where exactly was the problem, um, uh, you know, uh, because you see, it's uh, in, in most uh, discourses, you would have seen that, oh, women are, have been economically deprived or they have not been given as much opportunities. So what Gilman actually does in this essay is that she gets into the structural discussion of how economics works, of how uh, you know, the idea of labor and a payment for that labor works and within that framework then, where do women figure or what makes us say that women are economically dependent, right? So, these are uh, the points that she uh, discusses when she uh, talks about um, masculinity, when she talks about economic progress and she talks about the economic dependence of women. Right. So these are some of the ideas that were uh, kind of important 
in the 19th century. Now, the second contention that she uh, uh, brings forth in the essay is that of economic value of domestic industry. Now, before we go into the details of this contention, I want to first ask you a question that, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is all the time uh, kind of uh, uh, discussed that women do work at home, housewives, they do, uh, they, they labor in the kitchen, they take care of the house throughout the day. Um, are they paid for that? That, 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 that also is a labor, right? But are they, I mean, is there any kind of a payment that they get uh, for that kind of work that they do? And the, this entire idea of working women, you see, who go out of the work, who, who, who go out of the house to uh, work, maybe they do these jobs at various places, um, they definitely get, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, whatever money that they, uh, that they kind of uh, command. But now uh, uh, I'm uh, kind of drawing your attention to the fact that we need to understand that what exactly does it mean to be a working woman and what is the place of a woman in a domestic setup. So if this woman is not going out of the house to work, does her labor within the house not command any kind of a economic value or not, right? So this is actually the introductory thought which would take us into this, uh, uh, into the heart of the second, um, uh, you know, um, uh, co uh, contention by Gilman, where she talks about the economic value of domestic industry, right? Now, I want to talk about the term uh, uh, domestic industry. Industry itself means what? It's a, it's a place of production, right? Where something is being produced by means of some kind of a labor that's being done. So domestic industry then means that Gilman is looking at the household, is looking at the domestic sphere in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the place where a woman is seen to be working, right? So usually domesticity is, uh, you know, kind of um, approached from the point of view of, say, domestic relations, a uh, relation between different uh, people in the family, the kind of dynamics that exist between them, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and also, uh, what is the position of different individuals in that setup? So, usually, whenever we talk about domestic or, or domesticity, these are some of the uh, concerns that come to mind. But here, Gilman, uh, you see, because her uh, um, uh, uh, point of entry is economics, so she is looking at this domain of the domestic from the economic perspective. And that's why she uses the term domestic industry, right? So we're going to further uh, uh, discuss uh, the, the relevance and the significance of this contention by uh, Gilman in the next part of the lecture. But right now, we have seen the two important um, ideas. First, she, uh, uh, it's a, uh, you know, the essay Women and Economics is a 19th century essay that was, uh, uh, you know, written by uh, Gilman in 1898. Uh, then we see that, uh, you know, how the title of the essay also is, uh, you know, very, very um, telling in the sense of uh, what its central concerns are. Then we also see that how, uh, you know, the, her, her first contention remains to be that how in the 19th century, at the time when she is writing, economic progress is, uh, you know, uh, was seen to be as masculine. And over there, uh, while discussing this point, she discusses how men then are seen to be at the heart of, um, uh, you know, the creation of wealth and how women then are, uh, you know, essentially economically independent uh, in the 19th century context. And after that, she goes into the discussion of this entire framework of what it means to be, uh, you know, economically independent and what it means to be economically interdependent in society, right? So that was the first contention. And then uh, in this lecture, we, we introduced the second contention, that is the economic value of domestic industry, 
that she uh, that's the next thing that she talks about in her essay that we're going to elaborate upon that um, in the second segment thank you